right, we are on the high fantasy track at DragonCon 2021. And we are here to talk about the 60th anniversary of a little character named Elric of Melnibony. I go Melnibony. Others pronounce it different ways. It's fantasy. It's, it's, pronounced, it's pronounced Melnibony. You're right. Hey, look at that. I just figured out it all by myself over the years. Isn't that cool? Yeah. Um, or Sorry, Gad. Didn't mean to you. Oh, and, um, and so for the 60th anniversary, we're going to talk about uh, the character, about some of the works and kind of the influences and, and what it's kind of meant to... Um, to fantasy movies and stuff and, and literature uh, today. So joining me, I'm Van Allen Plexico of the White Rocket Entertainment Network, among many other things, novelist. And um, joining me, let's go around the room here, starting with Joe. Hey, I'm Joe Crow. I am the uh, co-director with somebody, a couple of internets to my left. <laughs> um, yeah, <laughs> uh, I am a writer, an editor, a... Uh, pro wrestling announcer, uh, and I'm the co-director of the American Sci-Fi Classics track at Dragon. Okay, Rick. Um, I'm Rick Claw. Um, I'm, I'm an editor, writer, bookseller, critic. I've done just about all the things you can do working in science fiction over the years. Um, I also, I think I'm the only person here who's actually worked with Mike. I've edited a couple of books of his. I've edited a book of his, a collection. I've had him some of my anthologies. I did a letter. I did the letters page for the Michael Moorcock's multiverse comic, um, and among many other things with him over the years. But so that's who I am. So he's almost qualified to be on the panel. That's good. almost <laughs> more so than the rest of us for sure. But that's true. And then lastly, we have Gary. Hello, everybody. Along with that gentleman over there, I co-run the American Sci-Fi Classics track at DragonCon. So there, there. this uh, panel is brought to you almost halfway by another track at DragonCon. Uh, I am a writer, I'm a reviewer, I am a sometimes voice actor, uh, dashing man about town, and a fan of blades that eat souls. So There we go. And that's a prerequisite for being on this panel, I think. Honestly. Indeed. Well, it, my soul has been eating. I am broadcasting from within uh, Stormbringer. Mm. Having well, by the time, sorry, by the time the story is over, pretty much everybody has been. So you're just one step ahead of the rest of us, I think. Exactly. I beat the mm. rush. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and dive into Stormbringer now, just to save time later when it comes for me idea. anyway. Because yeah. Gonna... Well, and I get to call dibs on my corner in the. <laughs> no, no, this is yeah. my. <laughs> I've heard down near the hilt is kind of comfy. There's like a little more space there. To... You got leg room in the hilt, in the cross. Yeah, you can stick your feet out. Yeah, absolutely. It's nice. It's nice. So good. All right. Well, I have just a very loose outline. It's so loose. In fact, I didn't really share it with you guys. I just figured that we would just kind of go through some of the basics. So um, I'm going to lay out a few things that, that kind of I think of in terms of what who and what Elric and his world is and are. And I'm just going to say a few things and we'll go around and let you guys kind of throw in other things that, that a that a person just starting out coming to this property and wanting to know, well, what is this all about? What do I need to know to be able to enjoy this? Uh, what would you tell them? So I will start out and say uh, that Elric is um, he's the the prototypical anti-hero because he's he's kind of your protagonist, but he's also kind of in some ways a bad guy as well as a good guy, as much a victim as a as a doer. And um, and he's the um, he's the last emperor of sort of a not quite human race of beings that really really enjoy being very very mean to everybody else, and he's like not quite as mean, and so he's pondering the whole why do I not want to be mean, you know, and and maybe maybe my people should be more like that, and then he gets a really kick-ass sword so it gets much more complicated so who wants to step up next and kind of fill in what we should know about about elric um i can tell you what as a bookseller when for years when i was selling it to people what we tell them this is not lord of the rings it's kind of the anti lord of the rings actually um <laughs> and morcock has written essays about problems with lord of the rings um there is no quests in these books um, you don't have to read all the books and all the in a direct order. It doesn't matter. 
each of the each of the stories of Elric, they're self-contained. Now the stories continue, but you can stop. And then maybe you and you could read another one a year later, and you're not gonna be missing anything. He's not gonna leave you mid-scene. Um, it's a different way of doing it. It's and um so when you read them, and they're much bleaker than most fantasies. <laughs> Yeah, you, know, you got bit. a guy who lives, has to steal salt. He has a sword that keeps him alive. Sturminger is what keeps him alive. And in exchange, the, he has to get souls for that sword. So the guy's kind of bleak. It's a little yeah. bleak. He's not albino, yeah. you know, and he, he's not, you know, you, you don't think around, well, he's cuddly and stuff like that. It, there's a reason <laughs> that, you know, there's been a lot of trouble making a movie of Elric because it's not Lord of the Rings. And it's not going to look like Lord of the Rings. It's 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 dark and it's bleak, um, you know. And so that that's kind of how I tell people. So if you like your things a little darker in your fantasies, if you don't want you don't necessarily want quests, you don't want elves, you don't want fairies. This is the way to go. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of how I sell it. And you sell a lot of it that way. All right, <laughs> guys. Which one of you wants to uh, throw in something else that that reader would need to know? Uh, these are not cheerful books. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I think you nailed it with he's one of the epitome antiheroes. I mean, he's a mm -hmm. he's a character who I, I described him. I was having to tell Jess about the panel earlier. I was like, it's a bad guy running into worse guys. <laughs> That's right. A yeah. lot of the time. I, um, one of the things I didn't mention when I was talking about this, he was made. It was he was hired to write Elric. When his and his editor asked him to write a Conan type story, mm. ah. and that's what he came up with. Yeah. So Although he's... It's, it's... No, go ahead. Yeah. So it's much. That's why it's much bleaker and it's much more in that vein as opposed to where, you know, uh, Lord of the Rings comes from the Christian fantasy vein. Mm -hmm. You know, the Inklings mm -hmm. and stuff like that. He comes from the much darker side of it, and and, El and Conan is very bleak and dark. Mm. You know, and so. See, and if Finn was here, he'd jump right in and fix that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry, guys. Go ahead. I, I just forgot to mention that. Yeah. Uh, no, it's like, it, it's a character who's fascinating in that. Um, you know, he is the darker side of gray, but he's still gray. There are people mm -hmm. who are worse than he is. His own people are worse than he is, which yeah. is one of the things I find fascinating about him. And the fact that he's driven by so many different literal and figurative demons um, mm -hmm. and i think like a lot of people the first thing that caught my eye was some of the uh art by a uh, gould of those paintings of elric which are just beautiful pieces of art and i was like oh who's this guy i want to know more about this guy um and was it, I, was it and, not the wheelan gary uh i love the wheelan as well um but the Robert Gould ones are, are, are ones I really like, too. I, I but think the, much, the, it fits much better with what Elric actually is, the Gould. Yeah. As opposed to... The Wayland is beautiful. The Wayland is... It reminds me of Nagel. <laughs> uh, but they're very... I mean, those are beautiful pieces, too. Um, mm -hmm. But, yeah, he... In, and that Black Blade inspires so many artists, mm -hmm. including musicians. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, which I'll let Joe talk about that. Uh, yeah, I was going to get to that. I, when um, I started working in the geek journalism area, like in, in 1999, there was a giant hole in my reading, my knowledge. And in fact, somebody else on this panel, Mr. Rick Claw, it, pointed me to Elric. And since then, I'm sorry. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> but, no, not really, but go ahead. <laughs> but no, he, um, he, he said, you know, you, you ought to be reading this. And I said, well, okay. And he was right. Um, that's right. Get on record. But I said, Rick Claw was right. <laughs> but, 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 but the, but the thing is, it, they're so, uh, they're so, they're the like like you said the the stories don't have to continue you could just jump in read one and then and then that's it but the now you'll want to read more but you yes, don't have to read more that, exactly 
exactly. But Elric to me is just heavy metal. It, yeah. It, it, it seems like 1970s heavy metal to me. I think of um, album covers when I'm reading mm -hmm. Elric. And Elric himself, the character, has led to actual heavy metal music. Like mm -hmm. uh, there's a Deep Purple song called Stormbringer, but the Deep Purple guy claims he, it, it's not related to Elric. Like, shut up, Deep Purple guy. You, <laughs> you, you are lying, David Coverdale. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, and then uh, um, um, uh, Michael Moorcock himself wrote, uh, Michael Moorcock himself wrote a um, uh, lyrics to a song called Black Blade, which I believe is by Blue Oyster Cult. Yep. Yes. So. He actually performed with them, didn't he? If yes. I'm not mistaken, yes, he was. He was a rock musician. I mean, he was a big part of Hawkwind. Mm. Oh yeah, yeah, Hawkwind, yeah, Hawkwind. Who did an entire Chronicle of the Black Sword album, or set? It was you know, and uh, with Mike Moorcock's reading in between it, he's reading like poetry on the album. They're performing songs, and then he'll read, have interludes while he's reading, narrating what's going on. Why isn't music cool like that anymore? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> what happened? I just don't get. Well, yeah. This all um, this. Oh, go ahead, Rick. Go ahead, Rick. I was going to say one thing I forgot to mention when I was talking about. It's been a long time since I've had to try to sell Elric, which is what you're asking me to do right there. Right, right. Um, sure. I've made a bookstore in a long time. One of the things that's different about Elric as opposed to other fantasies too. It's not good versus evil. Mm -hmm. No, it's not about that. It's chaos versus order, which is different. Anybody who plays D and D knows that they're different. Uh, yeah, and as a matter of mm -hmm. fact, Elric. And Moorcock's work has huge influence on D and D. Oh yeah, structure. If anybody who plays Dungeons and Dragons should be reading Elric. Okay, yeah, and the you, whole if you haven't, then you're doing yourself a disservice. Yeah, the whole so order chaos thing comes yeah. pretty much from him, and right. it was also lifted heavily by anyone who plays Warhammer. Yep. Um, oh yeah. And so and also Moorcock also came up the whole concept of the multiverse. Yes. Which Elric the eternal is champion. one of the first? Yeah. In which he's one of the, the first. Multiverse of Madness. Yes. <laughs> That's a whole other track, Van. Ah, <laughs> yeah. dang it. All right. Yeah. Well, but, but you guys yeah. have opened the door to exactly what I want to ask you about next, which is mm -hmm. so now that we understand that he's so repulsive in some ways. Why do we find this character in his world so compelling? Why why don't we go, ooh, no, no, I don't want any part of that. Why are we like, ooh, give me some more Elric. I want to know more about it. What What is it that makes that so compelling? I'll start this time with Joe. Morbid curiosity. <laughs> <laughs> because you, uh, I read the one of the first Elric stories I read, uh, it starts out bad for him and gets worse. Mm-hmm based on his own choices it's yes. not it's not that he is you know has an an unde undefeatable foe it's he chooses to go one way instead of clearly the better option <laughs> yes. and then he 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 uh he, he betrays people do not um get attached to anyone in an elric story and um don't be his friend <laughs> no do not be his friend <laughs> there's a reason that his, his there's a reason that his best friend is eternal Morcock would also not have eternal champions he'd have eternal companions too mm, yes. and that Morcock no, sorry that Elric's companion was Moonglum there's yeah. a reason that he's named that <laughs> okay <laughs> uh, you know so yeah you're right it also it's also it shows a darker side of humanity mm -hmm. and we're always fascinated by look it's like why people are fascinated with serial killers we're looking at the darker sides of ourselves and um, and it, it, people are always fascinated with that. So you look at it and you go, wow, that's really bleak. You know? <laughs> and you tell yourself, oh, I'm not that bleak. My world's not that sucky. <laughs> you know? and, um, and I think that's part of it. You know, yeah. so you, it, it's like that when, like I said, whenever you read something that's dark. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I mean, El, he makes decisions that you're just like, really, dude? <laughs> and I mean, I, I don't know if we're worried about spoilers or not in this conversation. No, uh, no. no. I mean, this is a guy who destroys his entire city. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, come on. You know, um, and also he worships Ariok, the Lord of Chaos and, the, and a Duke of Hell. 
Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, the whole thing, you know, it's, was it um, uh, Blood and Souls for, El- for Arioch? Yeah. Mean, you know, well, it wasn't yeah. his first choice. It just kind of played out that way. But well, fair yeah. enough. I mean, well, yeah. And I think that part of that fascination as well is the fact that he is. <clears throat> I'm glad that Conan was referenced earlier because, in a lot of ways, he's the anti Conan. He yes. is weak, he's frail, mm-hmm. he's a magician. The only reason he's able to stand upright is because he's taking these basically drugs Mm -hmm. and keeping himself because, you know, he is an albino. He is frail. uh, And the only reason he's able to be the eternal champion and fight and defeat these people who are worse than he is, which is another part of the fascination. I think we always kind of like dark versus evil storylines. Look at like the first four seasons of Dexter. Uh, we like to see bad guys taking out worse guys because the bad guys get the, the play dirty. Mm-hmm. And, uh, the only reason he's able to do that is he finds this obviously evil sword, which is sentient, and goes, hey, come on, let's kill some people. Give me souls. Feed me souls. And he's like, well, you know, you might Eric, have a point. Is, the sword is also says, I'm going to keep you alive. Yes, and I'm going to make There's it powerful. Too. It's yeah. not. It's not like he's just taking the sword and killing people. He's well, getting, yeah, this, he he is sword. getting a benefit out of it. Yes, <laughs> you know, you know, and he's trying to control it. He's trying to contain. He's like, if if I have to do this, I want to be in control of it so I can limit its damage to as minimal as possible. I feel so. Like. He's like the Lando Malari. Yeah, <laughs> fair enough. Well, you also got to remember, you know. The thing is, too, though, and also when you're reading Elric, you like Elric, which is, yeah. this, you, I, you know. He's charming. And, yeah. Well, and bar, besides Joe here, who obviously read him when he was older for the first time, most people I know were first exposed to Elric in their teens. Mm. And he identified you when you're in your teens. Being empowered like that, it really comes to you. You're like, wow, you know, I can understand this, you know, especially geeks. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And when we were, when I was a geek... Uh, you know, this was in the you know, in the eighties. You know, they, you, you were powerless. You really hadn't, you know. And so, me and my fellow geeks, we would read Elric, and it, gave, it was empowering to you. You know, because this guy, yeah, he's, he's, he's an weak. outsider. I'm an outsider. Yeah, he's weak. You know, so we were usually geeks are weak, weaker, muscular than other, you know, the, the jocks yeah. or whatever. And His so, family does guy, not got the sword. Him. Yeah. You can't uh, get the and, girl, all these yeah. things. Yeah. I had, yeah. I had, um, I had heard of Elric, um, but like, like I said, I did not read anything uh, El- Elric wise until uh, the turn of the century, like, like I was saying. But I, my first um, experience with Elric was when he was in the Advanced Dungeons and Dragons books, mm. that one yeah. entry, and I read him, and, and and I remember telling my other my other guys, "Can I play this dude?" <laughs> and they all said no because he's <laughs> yeah. too powerful. Uh, and I and I thought, well, okay, I quit then. But I didn't quit. I'm just, <laughs> but but Elric, if I can't be I, a god. I'm not playing. Yeah, exactly. Forget <laughs> it. But but yeah, no, I I I thought, well, this is the coolest dude. And I think Conan's stats were in the same book, maybe the mm-hmm. same page. But. Um, so cool and and that stuck with me and it just kind of was in the back of my head for years and i never took the leap until like i said until 2000 but uh it's it's good stuff would they let you play conan no <laughs> they didn't let me play. <laughs> mm-hmm. wow you need well, new you, friends I, you I, had, I had bad friends i had bad friends you guys are doing a magnificent job of anticipating my questions you've already answered like five of my questions i've only asked two so we we're like we we're like right way ahead of schedule. So I'm I'm so I'm where I, where I was going to go with that was my actually my next question was and let's see if everybody's answered it to their satisfaction because I think Rick did. Uh, he just Rick, you figured out what I was about to ask basically, which is do, we we do root for Elric I think more or less while we're reading him. Um, is it because we just automatically root for the protagonist, the central character in the story, or is there more to him that makes you want? him to find a way out of this and succeed somehow. Gary, what do you think? I think that is part of it. And there's, there is definitely that fascination of you read it of identifying with him. If you read him at the right age, which I, I did, I was just fresh out of high school. I think when I, or I was, in, I was my oh, senior year old. high school. 
Yeah, yeah when I got old. introduced to him. I was 14 when I read Elric. Yeah, but I was, you know, I was, I was, I was immature for my age. <laughs> Still am. Uh, so you identify and you, you get this idea of, well, what would I do? You know, and, you know, I, all these people who are against me, give me a, a sword that eats souls and not let me wreak some havoc and maybe I can control it. Maybe I can't. Um, but there is like, the, as much of a jerk as El as Elric can be, there is some noble aspects to him that mm -hmm. kind of draw you, and you keep kind of hoping and rooting for those aspects to come out on top. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they do, yeah. and then sometimes he kills his sister. You know, yeah, <laughs> his entire war, his entire society. You yeah. know, the, the world. <laughs> you know, reality. <laughs> you know, reality itself. Things. Yeah, but yeah, th th those little things that happen. Little mm -hmm. thing. Joe is. What do you think about that, Joe? Is there are the, what are the reasons why we kind of root for him? I I think um, part of it is just well, he's the lead character in the story, right. but uh, I, I believe there's something uh, attractive about how awful he is, and about his ridiculously bad decisions, and um. Yeah, it is hard to under, understate how bad decisions he makes. Yeah, and really, the the Moorcox writing is so uh, the 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 depth and the uh, he doesn't write like a highfalutin fantasy writer. Mm -mm. Um, no complaint. I mean, not to judge highfalutin fantasy writers, but I mean that's uh, the whole he, point of this track. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He, it's I'll high fantasy, like not highfalutin yeah. fantasy. There you go. But, That's the track uh, coming next year. Yeah, but, <laughs> but we call um, it in the Alabama convention. Oh boy, uh, it um, it uh, uh, um, the Elric stuff is so um, it's mm -hmm. like it's always raining. Like it is now in reality, as we're as we're taking this, it's like it's always raining in Eric's world. Everybody's miserable, everything's miserable, but this dude's got a cool sword. <laughs> uh, that's that that's um, I think the attraction, or that that's why you you follow Elric. You uh, you think, well, something's gonna happen with this dude. He he's gonna he's gonna ruin something in in, in this story. Well, it's interesting because I was just thinking when you said that, all I was thinking of, I started thinking of Blade Runner, mm. and Decker, who makes all these stupid decisions. <laughs> it's always raining. And it's raining constantly in Blade Runner, of course. You know, that's, you know, that's, it's one of the things. But to answer your question, yes, is the answer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're both right. I mean, there's no, yeah. you know, and Moorcock was, he was a really good writer. You know, he still is a good writer. And he's gotten, he got better. As he was going along, but and he understood what he was trying to write. Uh, Mark Cox is really he's really smart. He's a really intelligent man, and he understands what he was writing. Um, and he it was only supposed to be a one off, and then you know of course it got more and more popular. And uh, he would write Elric when he needed money to like when he was doing um, New Worlds. In case, if y'all don't know, Moorcock was I know y'all probably know, but people are listening. Uh, Moorcock was famous. One of the things Moorcock is famous for was editing New Worlds magazine in the 60s, which ushered in the uh, new wave of science fiction. Okay. And it was, it, you know, so you wouldn't have had a lot of the science fiction that came later. You wouldn't have, like, you wouldn't have cyberpunk if it wasn't for Moorcock doing New Worlds. Never would have happened. There's a direct correlation to it. There's a direct line. So when he was doing New Worlds, which didn't sell that well, because things like that don't sell that well usually, he would write a new Elric to fund the magazine. Because he knew he'd get top money from the new Elric. So, okay, I'll go write new Elric. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why he started writing more of them because people would pay him for them. So, yeah. And uh, you got to yeah, pay the bills. Yeah, exactly. Well, that's, you know, that's what writers do. They have to, have to eat. They're mm -hmm. funny like that. Occasionally. I, I do notice that, um, I, like, I, last year I was reading the, the Rune Staff mm -hmm. four books. Yeah. And they were very early. Moorcock, as I understand it, they're they're mm -hmm. pretty early, and you could see he was really just writing like a sword and sorcery soap opera, you know, with like one over the top fantasy scene after another, big monster, 
battle, big monster battle. It's still really cool and it's so colorful. But I mean, he just like, you know, you know, the pulp writers with the purple prose, he has like uh, ultraviolet purple prose. It is just, he slathers on the, and it's, it's never like in a negative way. It's just like he finds an incredibly evocative and lush way to describe things, just mm-hmm. piling up the, the words and the, and the images. And, and you mm-hmm. see what I'm getting at is you see that in the, I think in the Elric stories that were written f- earlier mm-hmm. and then the ones later mm-hmm. are a little more straightforward and a little less just sorry, pouring <laughs> the gallons of, you know, descriptions and, and imagery in. So there's a, I can noticeably te- tell mm-hmm. the arc of his writing as it goes across from the earlier books to the later ones. For oh, sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He, well, he matured he was, because he was very young when he did Elric. Mm-hmm. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, the fact that Morcox, what he's he's in his early eighties now, yeah. yeah. So he was twenty something, early twenty. I mean, I remember how depressing it was when I turned thirty, and I knew Morcock at the time, and it, it occurred to me that when he was when I when he turned thirty, if he had never written another word, he still would have been a legendary. Writer. We'd still be talking about him, mm-hmm. uh, you know. And it, it's like that's amazing. You know, he could have never written another word after that point, and you would all gone. Huh. Well, he's a fantastic writer. Uh, so yeah, he was. You know, he was. He was really good. Blessed with a lot of talent, or is blessed with a lot of talent. He's still alive. Uh, you know, yeah. Yeah. Um, but so yeah, I mean, it's. But yeah, I do know what you're saying, Van. He and he got better too. Uh, yeah. Um, and I think again, I hate to draw, keep drawing that parallel, but he pairs well with Conan and with Howard in the same. When I read Howard and when I read Moorcock versus when I read like Tolkien, there's dirt under the fingernails. Yes. There's blood on the sword. There this is a it's like Fafford and the Grey Mouser. It's that this is a, a fantasy level where, you know, we're not getting high elves who are graceful and oh mm. we're getting, you know, gr- you know gritty. <laughs> dark um, really dark or and just feels more realistic more grounded even though he, his work is more fantastic i mean there's elements of the fantastic in conan but not quite like you know oh, like, no. like you know how you know conan's like at about a six elric's at about an eight <laughs> which it, it's interesting because of all of his eternal champions which he Morcock had decided that he was he was going to be rewriting this. It, sorry, he decided that everybody was going to re, was rewriting the same characters over and over again, just not admitting it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he was going to admit it. <laughs> That's where the Eternal Champion comes from. Um, and so he, so it's not even the most fantastical of the of the uh, Eternal Champions. And to me, it's not even the best of the Eternal Champions. Um, I think Quorum is a much better. Mm. And, and uh, uh, the uh, shoot, the Von Beck books are way out there, much better than Elric. Um, now, I love Elric, but they get better as he was going along with these other characters. He was able to explore new ideas, and his writing got better. Um, but it's well, not the- an accident that the second Elric appearance of comics was in a Conan comic. Well, yeah, Rick, hold on then. Let, let's, then let's, okay. let's address that. Why is it that if, if, if and, and I'm not necessarily agreeing with you, mm-hmm. but let us stipulate, Your Honor, let us stipulate... <laughs> That other other versions of the Eternal Champion are superior. Mm-hmm. Why is it that Elric gets all the attention and makes all the money and commands all the attention? Um, he's pale with a cool sword. He is pale with a cool sword. But, I mean, quorum has got a, a missing an eye. He's got a robotic hand. He's got a metal hand. I mean, he's really cool, too. And, yeah, who doesn't? But the, the thing is, is that what it is... How do I put this? Um, the Elric book, Elric is simpler. They're not as complex, and they're much easier to get into. Um, the Von Beck books, in particular, they're a much more bigger investment of reading, you know, um, than the Elrics are. And it's and I, and it, this doesn't say I don't like Elric. It just it, this is what happens with writers. They tend when they start putting more and more complex things in, fans don't always go with them. Mm. True, you know, and. Um, so, yeah, I think that's what happens with that. And Elric is, you know, he was the first, and he was all over the place, you know, um, because that's, you know, where he started with. 
Um, I mean, there are Eternal Champions before him, but they were oh, Eternal Champions like afterwards. You know, like he said later, we're going to make them Eternal Champions. It wasn't thought of that way. Um, so I think it's just I think it has to do with that. You know, uh, it has to do with people's in, in willingness to invest in the. It takes a lot more investment of time and energy to read some of these books. Mm-hmm. I mean, Elric books are really easy reads. I mean, I, like I said, I love Elric, but you'll sit down and read an Elric book in an afternoon. Yeah. They're all short and they're quick reads. But, you know, Von Beck starts getting thicker and thicker and Corms are all pretty thick. You know, they got thicker. And so they, they're more investment of time. And then, yeah, of course, fantasy, fantasy fans have no problem with thick books. But let's be honest, a lot of these fantasy books that are thick, and I'm about to insult a ton of people, aren't that complicated. <laughs> the books aren't that complex, okay? They're really not. You know, they're 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 you know they're they're um a, they're not adventure fiction. Well, adventure fiction, but they're quest fiction. So people are just going on these quests, you know, where they go point A to point B to point C. And Moorcock doesn't do that, so it's a lot a little more complex. Um, and I think that's the reason. You know, and like I said, I probably have insulted you know anybody <laughs> who's you know. Like still fantasy, and you know what? I don't care. But <laughs> they'll never it's... let you back on this track again. Yeah. Oh well. You know. You don't want to get started on Tolkien because I'll rip Tolkien to pieces for you if you <laughs> oh, like. Oh boy. Yeah. Let's quickly change the subject, Joe. Yeah, Joe, so... help, help us. <laughs> help me out here, Joe. So, uh, what is it about Elric? Oh, yeah, Tolkien's feeling? terrible. What? No. <laughs> <laughs> the screen just goes black. I have nothing to say about that. <laughs> <laughs> No, Joe. What what is it that, that 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 makes him appealing and keep going when there are pro- po- potentially other properties, even from Moorcock, that that might have might subjectively be called better? I think that um, Rick, Rick really covered the like because he's first, because he's first, and um, the other people, uh, the other the other characters are like like if you start talking about Michael Moorcock's stuff. Elric's going to be first. He's the first one. Like for for example, uh, Robert E. Howard invented tons of characters, but Conan's first and or, or biggest, and and that's who you talk about. But Elric has the um, and and as as you noted, uh, lots of them have been published, lots in lots of stories, but Elric was the big one. And he kept coming back to Elric. So I think uh, popularity breeds popularity. Um, that's true. That, I, I feel like I feel like that's part of it. I feel like because uh, uh, mm, it, because you've already you've already, you've got already this chunk of stuff that's Elric, and everything else well, you get to through Elric. Like you go, you get. In my opinion, you get to Corum from Elric. Yeah, you don't. Well, you don't go to Corum first. Also, Elric has never been out of print. The first, the core seven books have been in print continuously since 1971. They've never been out of print in the United States or in England since 71. Ah. So, if you go to any used bookstore in this country, you're going to find Elric books. Mm-hmm. Wow. <laughs> you know, I mean, they're yeah. there. You know, you go, oh look, there they are. You know, and so. Uh, they get in heavy rotation. And I, like I said, I think certainly for teenagers, when you're 15, you know, 14, 15, whatever, you're not ready for those heavy, the bigger concepts that Moorcock talks about later. Okay. Yeah. They get much headier, the concepts. And so you read them when you're younger. And so people they stick with people. Yeah. And some yeah, people just don't continue down that track. Mm-hmm. There, yeah. There's a simple purity to him. He is a doomed hero trying to make his way in a world. Mm-hmm. And it, that is something for, like, like we were saying before, it's something really easy for a teenage, angsty teenager to sink their hooks into and identify with. Um, this guy, you know, trapped in a world he has no control over and just trying to survive. But, you know, you know to like most teenagers, you know, stay, oh, oh, my life is so yeah. hard. Oh, it's so terrible. Exactly. I have a sword that eats souls and I can cast magic and I work for a demon lord. My life is terrible. Yep. Yep. Exactly. And that I think you summed it up. I mean it's you know, it's it's one of those things. It's all these years. And people are it's interesting when you do events with Moorcock, people are nuts for it. I remember 
doing an event with him when I was working for book people. And there's like 20, 30 people in line, 40 people in line. This guy comes up and he's on the line. And Moorcock is great. He'll sit there and talk to people forever, sign all their books. He's a really nice guy. And the guy gets up there and he starts taking his shirt off. We're like, holy shit, the guy's taking his shirt off. And so we're like, what, what the hell? And so the guy turns around and he's got a tattoo of Stormbringer from his from his butt cheek, butt crack, all the way to the top of his, his neck. Wow. Entire back. <laughs> it's like, holy shit. I, <laughs> that's nuts. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, he's got some rabid fans for Elric. It's, you know, I was going to talk about adaptations and artistic representations. I didn't know we were going to go there. <laughs> Uh, literally down there, but, um, <laughs> but I think that, that, that touches on that. That's a good segue there too, though, is that when, when somebody is wanting to do a graphic novel, for example, of a Moorcock property, you know, you could do one of those others that written, Rick mentioned, and you might sell a few copies, but if you mm-hmm. do a new Elric thing, you're I probably going to sell a lot more copies. Right. And so, mm-hmm. and he's a visual character he's visually it, stunning everything about him is, well, is designed them, to look good in graphic novels unless barry windsor smith does them apparently yeah. you all have seen you have seen the conan the elric yeah. conan the, for, he has conan and, El, and conan and elric's wearing like a blue hat conal conal hat blue mm-hmm. hat it looks like a pope <laughs> and his out he's got a big red cape on like, i don't know who that is but it's sure telling elric it says it's elric it says Elric. It says Elric right there. It doesn't look Elric like Elric. Smith from Brooklyn. It's a different, <laughs> different Elric. It's a different Elric. And, yeah. and from, Mark yeah. co-wrote it. He co-wrote the story for that. And huh. it, it, but apparently, Barry Windsor Smith didn't. Nobody told Barry Windsor Smith what Conan looks like. And so he <laughs> just drew him. Uh, we drew Tom Bombadil instead. That's cool, yeah. man. Yeah. Right. With a big black sword. Yeah. I, I, see, I, I would I, kill to have a CG movie of Elric. So with a lot of people, there's a problem yeah. with that, though. And here's the problem with it. it, it it's just like the same problem we had with uh, the John Carter movie. Oh, okay. Oh Elric is yeah. so influential on all these different things. Like people are going to say, well, it's just Game of Thrones. It's he did it first. He's influential on Game of Thrones. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Elric. I mean, huge. Um, and so – People will look at it, it won't seem original, just like when John Carter came out. Everybody's like, well, it's just a rehash of Star Wars. No, you don't get it. <laughs> Where do you Star think Wars Star Wars ripped John it off Carter. from? Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. And so it, it, so that's that's what, that's what a big fear of the, an Elric movie being made. People, I'm not saying they should make, they shouldn't make one. I would love to see one. Mm-hmm. Uh, but people are going to have that same effect. They're going to look like, well, we've seen this before. They're, they're going to have to make it more like The Witcher where it's very visually distinct and about that one character mm-hmm. as opposed to a big sprawling tabletop of a map where we're going all over the kingdom. I mean, right. I think it needs to be like, you know, where we're following that one person yeah. on his, on his journey. But see, yeah. The problem is people are going to say, go, that's just like the Witcher. <laughs> yeah. And they're, and they're going to say, he even looks like the Witcher. Yeah. Oh, the Witcher. yeah, that's true. yeah. Um, and I mean, there's a good chunk of anime that's heavily influenced by Ulric, okay? Oh, yeah. And so you're going to have that same effect, too. People are going to go, well, it's just like this anime we watched. It's like, oh, jeez, no, it's not. It's, you know, and, <laughs> you know, so that's a problem with it. I agree. I'd love to see a movie. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, just they would have to spend a good chunk of the budget on educating people. <laughs> by the way, I, this is the guy everybody ripped off. Yeah. It's true. So, you know. But we would have to find some – also, we would have to find somebody like a Peter Jackson, somebody who loves well, and understands the material and knows how to and was, yeah, adapt it and has the passion. It was supposed to happen yeah. uh, with uh, – what's his name? Uh, where is it? Uh, Chris and Paul Welch Welt were supposed to do it. Mm-hmm. It was supposed to be their next fantasy thing after they did his Dark Materials. And we all oh. know how well that went. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, I mean, that movie was terrible, and it tanked. And so the studio's like, oh, we're not touching. We don't want to do another fantasy with you people. Oh! Right. And so, you know. Which might have saved us, because if that tanked, what would they have done to Elric? So, right. Yeah. yeah. Possibly so, yeah. yeah. I, I always think how many bullets we've dodged over the years with bad adaptations of stuff that we love, you know? I mean, mm-hmm. how many yeah. bad Chronicles of Amber movies have we not seen? 
Yeah, I was about to say, Van, the Chronicles of Amber brought to you by uh, the guys from Game of Thrones. Oh, God. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of things like that. I mean, yeah, for every Game of Thrones. You eat bowls, Game of Thrones. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's you're going to get crap. I mean, it's I'm not saying I would love it to be made. And I think we're finally at a stage when they could do it, uh, give, mm-hmm. give it, do it well, visually, at least for the longest time you couldn't do it because. The, you know, you, you clearly you have to have an albino. I think Mike told me once that somebody wanted to make a movie of it, but he couldn't be an albino. Well, yeah. that, really, then what's the point? <laughs> let's 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 uh, fantasy cast just popped into my head is Doug Jones. Yeah. Doug Jones is Elric. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's a lot of people. You, you, the thing is, you still you, you can't say well. Well, we, does he have to be an albino? I think that's a kind of. Yeah, kind of. Does he have to suck souls with his sword? Yeah, kind of. That's kind of an important element. It's kind of part of it, yeah. yeah. It's like going, so, we're going to do a Star Wars thing, but can we get rid of the Force? Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it's so, These yeah, lightsabers are stupid. Get rid of them. Yeah, they have slingshots. <laughs> Wait a minute. You could the, make that are we, are we married to the Hulk being green? Right. <laughs> no. Hey. Gray works just fine. <laughs> It's cheaper too. To so, do so it actually is, yeah. If we don't have movies or TV, which we don't, there's we certainly can't complain that he hasn't been done in other media. Oh yeah, oh yeah. I'm and place. and I I wanted to ask what you guys' favorite adaptation was. Let me let's just run around here uh, quickly. I think we got about seven or eight minutes left. So, Joe, what wh- how, what's your favorite way to consume the Elric product? Uh, outside of the books. Of course, um, a mutual friend of of several of us on, on the panel, Chris Roberson, wrote right. a um, an, an Elric crossover comic book uh, for mm. Boom Studios a few years ago called um, um, Oh shoot, what was it called? It was called The Balance Lost, where right. Elric and the other Eternal Champions right. teamed up, and it's like a mini, it's a mini series, and it's just so good. Uh, it's, um, it's Chris Roberson trying to, you know, uh, pastiche Michael Moorcock and it's just neat. Uh, it, that, that's one of my favorite things. I, uh, he wasn't trying to adapt an Elric story. He was trying to smoosh them all together and do a Marvel team up with them. And, (laughs) and it's, it's all right. It's, it's not a bad thing. I dig it. Cool. Gary, what's your uh, favorite uh, adaptation beyond the books? Uh, probably the music, the Black Blade and uh, mm. the Hawkwind album, but or the the Robert Gould um, prints. I mean, just those are those are kind of, those covers are what hooked me into reading the books partly as well. Yeah. Cool. Oh. Rick. Okay. Well, I'm going to talk a little ego here first. I'm going to d- side pass the Elric comics that I was involved in. Uh, <laughs> obviously <laughs> and um i think actually the ruby throne the recent one that was done by the french artist uh oh, yeah. blondel yeah. yeah it's gorgeous um they're yes. done in album size and they're, they're really freaking amazing titan reprinted them over here mm. um they're probably some of the most faithful elric adaptations ever done mm. um and they're really bleak. I mean, you know, and of course, I liked when I was a kid, I loved the you know, younger, yeah, you know, I was a kid, I guess, with the, um, I loved the Michael T. Gilbert adaptations of El oh, Mel Yeah. Um, those were really great. And, you know, there was, there was a lot of them that were really, there was just some really great ones. But yeah, uh, I really liked that Ruby Throne. It's so great. It's bleak and depressing. You'll love it. <laughs> You, know, you you didn't ask if it was you know it's very faithful to Elric. It's like in the that's like, no, we said that it was good. We didn't say it was fun, but we said it was good. <laughs> that's exactly, that's right. That's exactly what I was going to say though. Is that for me? I mean, I read the uh, the P. Craig Russell ones that wasn't Marvel epic, whatever, putting them out. Uh, Marvel, the, yeah, they were actually they were done first, but they were done first by first, <laughs> and then yeah. okay. and then Marvel did. I think it was that way. I can't remember. Because yeah. I've written an article about the, his comics history, but of course I didn't bring it up and put it in front of me like a dummy. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, there was. I know he did. They were done. He did several of them, and of course, then he later on did Stormbringer with uh, Dark Horse. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, well, it's a. Uh, 
there's a lot of, I and mean, Moorcock has been involved with comics outside of Elric. He, he wrote comics in the uh, 60s, the early 60s. So, so those, he, those, the sorry? P. Craig Russell ones, I'm sorry, the yeah. P. Craig Russell ones that I was just referring to, I really did enjoy those back in the day, back in, I guess, the, the early 80s or whatever, when that was going on. Um, it kind of, it kind of blends in my mind with like some stuff that Pacific was doing and all, but I may be getting it confused. Yeah, there was a Pacific lot of stuff. Some of them too. There was a lot of stuff happening back then. It was, it was kind of exploding, but yes, I kind of like Elric had kind of died down a little bit for me. It had been years and years. I, I picked up a trade paperback, like, you know, they're constantly being reprinted, as you said. And there's a, mm -hmm. there's an edition that came out five or six years ago. I was reading that. And then I stumbled across the Blondell, uh, the first hardcover that came out around 2014, 2015, the French trans, the translation yeah, from French. Talk about, yeah. And I got that. It's 20 bucks hardcover on Amazon. I devoured that thing. And I'm like, I'm like, A, this is gorgeous. It's so well written. It's such a great adaptation. And B, good Lord, all the stuff I'd forgotten in Elric that, that P. Craig Russell kind of wallpapers over, you know, mm -hmm. to make it PG rated. Oh no, they ripped the cover right off. And it's, it's hard R, man. I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> Yeah, those Mel Nibanians, man. They were they were up to some, they were up to some stuff. Yeah, well, yeah. there's were book up two to and, some stuff. They were they were man, and book two and book three have come out. I got them, and book four comes out December, right here. So, yeah. um, which will be called I can't remember uh, Elric of Mel Nibanian, I think, and um, presumably be the last one. I'm not sure, but they've done they, they did the Ruby Throne Stormbringer. The, the White Wolf, and now One More is Coming. I, I do know Moorcock. Those are Moorcock's favorites. Yeah. Those adaptations. Well, you can, adaptations. you can see why. Mm -hmm. you, can, you can see why. They're so, they're so well done. So, mm -hmm. um, oh, yeah. then, then the last thing I was going to mention, uh, although we might have another thing, the, the, the influence <laughs> that, that, that jumped out at me in a big way the last couple of days when I've been thinking about this is how much Jim Starlin's Warlock – borrowed mm -hmm. from oh, Elric. Yeah. So oh, is yeah. this a known thing that people talk about this outside of my circle? Actually, if you go look at, um, if you look at the Wikipedia entry in Elric, because I read that earlier, because I have not thought about Elric in a while. So I need some fresher. They talk about, they actually talk about Adam Warlock being influenced by Moorcox Elric in the entry. That yeah. makes Elric sense. and, Mor and uh, him are both jerks. Well, yeah. Uh, and now that you say it. They also have he has a soul gen. He has a soul sword. The, the, the soul thing is what keeps them alive. Mm -hmm. They have to eat these souls to keep, stay alive. You know, uh, they both are they're struggling with order and chaos, both mm -hmm. of them. I mean, they both fight guys with weird chins. A, yeah. <laughs> Adam Warlock is not a good versus evil character. He's no. chaos versus order. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, it's, yeah, I definitely. There's definitely that influence. You could find you. You can look at things all day long and say, "Oh yeah, that was influenced by Elric. That was too." Mm -hmm. Most 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 um, f contemporary fantasy writers from the last 20, 30 years have been influenced heavily by Elric. Yeah, yeah. So, and, anybody who's written an antihero, looking at you, Drow, and anybody who's ever played D and D and played an antihero is doing some variation on Elric. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep, and uh, it's. Yeah, and, uh, it's his impact. It's interesting because his in the United States he started differently than he is in the UK. In the, okay. the UK he started more of a literary writer. He's moved into that realm, mm. and the writers treat him that way. But in the US he's never made that jump, and the you know so it's an interesting juxtaposition. Um, so, but like you know, like you wouldn't have Alan Moore probably if if Mark right. had never written an Elric no a Rel oh. Elric novel, okay. I mean, it gets more when you did his Jerry Cornelius. That that really affected, you know. You know that's a whole different thing. But yeah. Um, but yeah, you wouldn't have those writers at all. You wouldn't have Neil Gaiman. Yeah. You know, if if Moorcock had not written it, I mean, these are guys that you that never would have happened. So yeah, it's um, his impact is amazing, um, and it, it's kind of sad that so many people don't know who he is now. He's due uh, for another renaissance. I've noticed he kind of so. comes and goes. Oh, yeah. yeah, he always has. People, you know, he, he's out there, then he kind of subsumes, and then uh -huh. someone's going through the uh, used bookstore, and, uh, and he just pops out again. Mm -hmm. I wonder why that is. 
everything moves in cycles. I remember when yeah. Conan was an obscure character. I remember what I had to explain to people. You know, one of my biggest things in high school was having to explain to people, no, H.P. Lovecraft is a writer. No, yeah. not of romance. No. <laughs> you know, and now you can get, you know, you, you can see the, the collection over my of, book of Cthulhu's on my bookshelf behind me there. Well, I mean, when I was a kid in high school, you guys can, I don't have to explain this too hard for you because you'll understand. My two favorite writers were Michael Moorcock and Philip K. Dick. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, you can see why. And of course, nobody knew who Philip K. Dick was. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the same thing. These things go around and he'll, you know, I mean, hopefully Mike will have a big resurgence again, hopefully soon. Mm -hmm. Before he dies. Um, yeah. You know, uh, speaking of bleak, you know, he, thanks, Gary. You're welcome. <laughs> and, and and he, he just did. He did. He has turned in a new Elric. So, oh, new there Elric we go. Coming out. I think it's next year. That, that'll go. do it. That'll kickstart yeah. it. So it let me else. let me summarize in our last few seconds here. We've got a new Blondell French graphic novel coming out in December. We've got the audio book with an, I think an introduction by Neil Gaiman coming out in December from Audible, and we've got new Elric coming out soon i think it's we next are year. next year all right we're out of time we're out of time gentlemen thank you so much it was awesome sure. it was appreciate pleasure. it everybody